Hello, thanks for tuning in to hear this week's message from Calvary Lake Havasu. Today's message will be focusing on Christian community. Our scripture reference is found in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. If you'd like to follow along with the Life Notes, download them now from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Peter Bunnell. Hey, you can all have a seat. It's great to be with you today. Now, while you're sitting down, you get to be multitasking, grabbing your Bible or your Bible app, and open to Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. That should breathe a sigh of relief. I didn't say Galatians 5, 23 through 23. You have a pop quiz. Let's say that verse together. You're, you're off the hook tonight. You don't have to recite a Bible verse, okay? Um, but hopefully you did memorize it, okay? Still hope that you memorize the fruit of the Spirit. But we're in Galatians uh, chapter 6, and we're starting off in verse 1. And while you're finding your way there, um, I got a question for you. Have you ever been caught in a trap? Somebody said, yep. Yeah. I was thinking, you know, it's not Indiana Jones. No one is going to identify with being caught in a trap. But how about being stuck? How many of you can identify with being stuck? Okay, so one of the last times that I was really stuck was when I was living in Iowa, and I was at work, and we had one of those fun things called a freezing rain. Now, if you're online and you're in the Midwest, you know what I'm talking about. If you've lived in the Midwest, you might know what I'm talking about. It rains, and then it gets so cold that it freezes to the ground and gives you like a couple millimeter sheet of ice. And then if you're really lucky, you get a heavy snow that comes down on top of it. And um, so I'm just trying to get you all to cool off, you know, 116 today, we're going to talk about snow. But um, I was at work, and we got freezing rain, then we got heavy snow, and um, after work, I went out to my car, and I had to drive out of the parking lot that was now covered with this much snow and that much ice, and I could not do it. My car is rear-wheel drive. And I didn't have any weight in the back. Rear-wheel drive, for those of you that have lived in, your, in the desert your whole life, is terrible for snow and ice. Um, and I couldn't do it. So I go back into the church, and I talk to the senior pastor. I'm like, I can't get out of the parking lot. And he would lived in Chicago. He would lived in the Midwest his whole life. He's like, okay, I'll see what I can do. He hops in my car. He starts driving it as hard as he could. I'm like going, my engine can't really do that, can it? Um, and eventually he gets it. Uh, to a spot that had been plowed so I could drive home. So I get in my car, and I'm going to drive home, and I realize that the whole time I also had my emergency brake on. (laughs) Now, if you're from the Midwest, you're probably thinking, why did you have your emergency brake on? Like, people in the Midwest don't even put on their emergency brake. Everything's flat. The car's not going to roll anywhere. But, um, yeah, so I felt pretty stupid that I had my emergency brake on. But here's the thing. I was stuck, and I needed help. There, I was not going to get out of that parking lot on my own. Today's passage is going to talk about what we do when we're stuck. Um, but not about a parking lot, not about being in our cars, but about things that are more important, things that are spiritual, things that have to do with our life. And as we turn to this passage, I'm just going to give a quick disclaimer Uh, This passage is directed towards people that have a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So if you're here and you're like, hey, I'm just checking this out. I don't know what I think about this Jesus thing. This is all new to me. That's okay. I'm glad you're here. I hope that as you hear this message, you hear about the hope Jesus can bring, the hope that a Christian community can bring into your life and the difference that it can make. But just know that God so loved you that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, that's Jesus, would not perish but have eternal life. And when you get that eternal life, when you come to Jesus, you get brought into this Christian community that can help you to get unstuck when you're in trouble. So let's take a look at this passage that is uh, written by the Apostle Paul, written to the church in Galatia, starting in verse one of chapter six. Brothers, If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, 
and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each one will have to bear his own load. So this passage is talking to the Christian community and how we are to treat and relate to one another. And if you get nothing else out of this passage or out of this message, I hope that you get this, and you can write this down. Spirit-led people bear one another's burdens. It's right there in verse two. Spirit-led people bear one another's burdens. Now, um, that means that when we're going through tough stuff, we have a community of people that are around us helping us. We could say it a couple of different ways. Christians lug each other's luggage, right? We all are carrying some baggage around and your fellow Christians will help you carry it. Christians will lift each other's load and they will um, help you when you're in a difficult position. Christians, if I can be a little bit crass, Christians will carry each other's crap. Okay, we all are carrying a little bit of crap, and when you're in a Christian community, um, they will help you carry that also. So spirit-led people bear one another's burdens. Let's delve into that a little bit more. Let's find out how we do that. So if, you look in, if you're looking at verses one and two, spirit-led people help those who are stuck in sin. Spirit-led people help those who are stuck now, you might be hearing that and you might be going, that sounds a little bit like conflict. I don't know if I like the idea of conflict. Let's talk about this, like answer some questions about what's going on when a spirit-led person is helping someone else who's stuck in sin. First, we have to answer a few questions. First, we have to answer who. Who's involved in this? And it says somebody who is caught in a trespass. This is not the idea of, aha, I caught you red-handed. You're guilty. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about somebody who is stuck in a sin, somebody who is ensnared, somebody who has uh, maybe taken a few steps into the traps of sin, and it's like quicksand, and they're sinking down, and they know that they're going to need help in order to get out of that quicksand. They need to be rescued. These are also like truly sin issues that we're talking about here. We're not talking about non-essentials. Like no one needs to come up and tell me that I'm drinking way too much aspartame in my Diet Coke, okay? You don't have to tell me that my five cups of coffee has too much caffeine. Or if you're in a corn syrup Nazi, you don't have to tell me that I need to stop having corn syrup, okay? Those are all non-essentials. We're talking about something that someone is habitually caught in, a sin that somebody needs help to get out of. So that's who receives this help. Who gives this help? Well, probably there's a lot of us going, well, of course the pastor gives that help, right? I'm going to call the pastor if there's somebody that needs that help. That's not what it says. It doesn't say pastors. It says those who are spiritual. That's everyone who knows Jesus Christ, right? If you think back to Galatians 5, we, talk, we, we learned about what it meant to be led by the Spirit and to walk by the Spirit and to have the fruits of the Spirit. That is what happened when we trust in Jesus. He changes our life and we become Spirit-led. So those who are spiritual, those who are Spirit-led are supposed to step in and help people that are stuck with sin. But I'll give you a, a word of wisdom here. And, and I got this from Pastor Chad, at least I think I did. Um, relationship precedes rebuke. And I really like that. Relationship precedes rebuke. What that means is that somebody has to know that you care about them. They have to know that you love them. They have to know that you have their best interest at heart before you go to them and you say, hey, I see that you're struggling with anger. Or hey, I notice that you are drinking a lot and it's affecting your judgment and the way you live. Before you can say those words, you need to have a relationship. They need to know that they're loved by you. It has to be presented with care and knowledge. So how does that happen? Well, at Calvary, one of the ways that that happens is through life groups. Okay, I'm the life group pastor, so I'm allowed to hammer this one a little bit. We need relationships. We are not supposed to live the Christian life alone. 
This is not something that is easily done, living our life to follow Christ all by ourselves. We need people that we're relating to, people that know us, people that we know, so that we can encourage them and we can build them up. And so that when we get stuck, we have people that are there to get us unstuck. People that know us and love us. That's what we want life groups to be about. You meet regularly and you develop Christian friendships as you share meals and as you talk and as you pray and as you read the Bible together. So life groups are a way that you invite this kind of community into your life. So what kind of help is going on here? Well, it describes it in this passage as restoration. Restoration. Um, who likes restoration projects? Anybody in here like restoration projects? Okay, you're in the company of my wife, okay? So my wife loves restoration projects. If you're ever driving through Lake Havasu and you see a black minivan pulled over next to a pile of junk, it's probably my wife, okay? And she is looking through this pile of junk and she's like, hey, look at this. I could use this for something. And so she'll pick it up, she'll put it in the minivan, she'll bring it home. She brought home a toy chest a couple of weeks ago and it was gross. And, and she, like, she cut down part of the lid and she sanded it and she stained it and she made a new cushion for the top of it, turned it into a bench seat with storage underneath it and now it's in our house and it looks great. That's, that's restoration, right? It's taking something that has lost its purpose, it's no longer good for what it was intended for, and it's making it like new, or making it better than new, or repurposing, repurposing it for something else. When we come to this passage and you see somebody who's stuck in sin and a spiritual person is going to restore them, it's going to bring them back into that right relationship with God. Going to make that relationship good again. And here's the beautiful news about that. That's what Jesus is all about. Jesus is about restoration. He came to restore us to a right relationship with God. On our own, we are all separated from God. On our own, we're all living apart from him. The Bible calls us God's enemies if we're not in Christ Jesus. But when we trust in Jesus, he brings us into God's family. Jesus is all about restoration. So when we, as a Christian community, embrace these steps and we embrace this system of restoring somebody, we are joining Jesus in his mission of restoration. So we've got the who, we've got the what. The next question is how. How is this help given? Well, it's pretty clear in this passage that this is given gently. It says gently right there. With gentleness kindness. So we've already covered that as a fruit of the Spirit. I think you guys get the idea of what gentleness and kindness is. It's calmly talking to somebody. Here's what it's not. It's not judgmental. It's not pointing a finger and condemning somebody. It is done in gentleness and with kindness and in love. So practically, you can't do this via email. Just in case anyone was thinking about going home and writing a strongly worded email, you can't do this with email. Uh, you can't pull out your phone and text this to somebody. Uh, it's definitely should not be done on social media with the rest of the world watching, okay? Gentleness requires that you go to somebody one-on-one -on -one and you talk to them and you ask them questions. And your love and your concern oozes out with gentleness and kindness. So why do we give this help? Why would we bother giving this help? Well, I think one of the reasons is because we're joining Jesus on his mission, but the other reason is to fulfill the law of Christ. You see that at the end of verse two. We bear one another's burdens so that we can fulfill the law of Christ, which means we're going to love others as we ourselves want to be loved. We're gonna treat others the way that we want to be treated. Now, a lot of times when we talk to somebody about a struggle they're having, or we wanna to talk to somebody about a sin that they're stuck in, uh, we use the word confrontation. They're confronting me. 
There was a book written in the 90s that was about Christian confrontation, and they titled it Care Fronting, C-A-R-E, Care Fronting, because it's supposed to be done with care. It's supposed to be done with love. It's not a conflict. It's not condemnation. It is lovingly coming alongside of someone and helping them to get unstuck. I thought it might be helpful for you to hear some of the ways that this has impacted my own life. Uh, in my first job, I had a Christian that was willing to come up to me and say, hey, Pete, I want you to know something. You're really intimidating. You intimidate me. I don't wanna talk to you. I don't wanna open up to you because the way that you act intimidates me. And I was like, man, I do not wanna be intimidating. That is not what I want to be perceived as. And so I had to change the way I was interacting at work and, and be different so that I could be less intimidating and more open to conversation. Uh, when I was on the mission field and my daughter was gonna be born, we were gonna go down to Thailand for her birth and we were gonna be there for three months. And I had a fellow missionary come up to me and say, hey Pete, I want you to know something. When you're down in Thailand, uh, there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for you to sin sexually. You're away from work, you're away from the people that you know, and there's gonna be tons of temptation for you to fall into while you're there. So I want you to stand strong. I want you to resist. And when you come back, I wanna ask you how things went. He cared enough to preemptively correct me, right? He cared enough to have that conversation, which could be kind of awkward, but he cared enough to bring it up. And that was powerful and that was helpful to me. I've had times in my life where I've had accountability partners, where I had a group of guys, a small group of guys who were able to ask me the tough questions, the kind of questions that you don't really want to answer, but you expected to answer them. So I've had those kind of accountabilities and they help you to walk the path that God has called you to. So spirit-led people help those who are stuck. What describes this help? Well, next you see that spirit-led people help with humility. Spirit-led people help with humility. So verse two says, bear one another's burdens. And I think that that's a broad topic. Okay, that's more than just people that are struggling with sin. I mean, that could be people that are having health issues. That could be people that are having financial issues, relational problems, um, emotional problems, like all kinds of burdens. Like we have all kinds of baggage that we're dealing with in this life. We had an example of that happen at the Olympics during one of the heats of the, 100 meter, the women's 100 meter dash. During that race, the athlete from South Sudan collapsed before she crossed the line. She collapsed in pain. The athlete from Laotia finished the race and then instantly ran back. Even though she was tired, even though she was exhausted, she ran back to that collapsed athlete, knelt down next to her. In fact, she beat the medics to the athlete. She was there first. She was the first person on the scene. And then she stuck with that athlete while she went to get treatment. She gave her comfort she gave her companionship during a time of pain and a time of difficulty. And afterwards, she was asked, why did you do that? And she said, we all know what it's like in a competition to get injured. We all know what it's like to be left behind in a race. And you want someone there with you. It's a powerful illustration of proximity of being close to people so you can get there first, so you can help bear that burden quickly. This is why life groups are important. Life groups are the first people that are gonna be there with you. They're the first people that are gonna know if you're going through a marriage problem. They're the first people that are gonna know if you are um, having financial problems. They're the first people that are gonna be there at the hospital with you. Proximity is important as you bear one another's burdens. But while you're doing this, there is the temptation of pride sneaking in. There is this temptation while you're helping someone else that pride sneaks in because you think, hey, I'm pretty good. I'm helping this person. Okay, I had that experience this last weekend. I will confess to you, okay? Um, this, the children's ministry team was a little short-staffed last weekend, and so I volunteered to help. I was in the pre-K uh, class 
which is really fun. I highly recommend the pre-Kers. They're hysterical. I was in that class and helping, and then somebody walked by and said, oh, wow, you're in this class today? And, like, I instantly got puffed up. Like, I instantly thought, yeah, I'm pretty good, aren't I, that I'm willing to come in here and help out. Like, you know, when we're helping someone out, we can begin to elevate ourselves. So, quick plug for the CK ministry. Don't let me get puffed up. Volunteer to go in there and help. Okay, you guys get puffed up, all right? No, you, you've got to remember that when you're helping somebody, you are just in the same race that they are. You have the same God that they have. You have the same Savior that they have. You have the same needs and the same necessity to have somebody come alongside of you sometime to help you. There's no room for pride. We have to be humble. So what is humility? Well, humility is thinking of ourselves accurately. There's been lots of great little sayings that kind of help you grasp what humility is. One of them is that a humble person doesn't um, think less of themselves, they think of themselves less. You probably have heard of that, right? A humble person is not sitting there thinking, I'm so bad, I'm so terrible. They're, they're just thinking of themselves less often. Other people are higher on their thought radar. God is higher on their thought radar. They worry about their own needs later on. Another helpful phrase that I like is, but for the grace of God, there go I. But for the grace of God, there go I. What does that mean? That means that I could be in that same situation as the person I'm trying to help, except for the grace of God. God has given me mercy. God has given me a gift. God has given me love. And so I'm in this position where I can help only because of God's grace. Otherwise, I could be in that same situation. And then, of course, Philippians 2, one of the great passages on humility where it says that we should have the same attitude as, that, as was in Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, becoming a servant and obedient to the point of death on a cross. Jesus, God's son, had the right to claim all worship, had the right to be um, worshiped, praised, and should not have had to die or suffer, but he emptied himself. He surrendered his rights. He was humble. That's our example of humility. So uh, let's do a little a quick test. Let's find your humility score. Let's find out how good you're doing on humility. This is a private test. You don't have to publish your results. Yes or no questions. Figure out how many yeses you know, how, how many yeses you have, how many no's you have. They're yes, no questions, okay? Keep track of your yeses and no's. Are you carrying others' burdens? So can you think of somebody who you're helping to carry their burdens, yes or no? Um, are you willing to see yourself needing the same grace as everyone else, yes or no? I need the same grace as everyone else. Number three, do you think of yourself as a servant? Like if you're gonna describe your attributes, is servant one of them, yes or no? Do you genuinely ask questions so you can get to know other people? Like, really ask questions to get to know somebody, yes or no? And the fifth and final question is, do you avoid judging others who are carrying baggage? Like, when you see that person that is carrying a load, do you judge them and say, well, it's probably their fault? Do you point a finger? Or are you humble? So yeses and nos. The more yeses you got, you probably are doing pretty good on the humble side of things. The more no's you got, you might want to pray and ask God to work out some humility in your life. So if we're carrying one another's burdens, does that mean we can blame others when we're not doing so hot and they didn't give us the help that we think we should get? No. So spirit-led people take personal responsibility. Spirit-led people take personal responsibility. You see that at the very end, verse five, for each of you will have to bear his own load. We have to take personal responsibility. So this passage in a whole makes it clear that sometimes we're gonna need help, sometimes we're gonna be stuck, 
Sometimes the burdens that we're carrying are going to be too much for us to do it alone, but we still bear the ultimate responsibility for carrying our own load. We won't be able to say, well, I would have dealt with it if my pastor would have called me, or I could have dealt with it if my life group would have helped me. We won't get to shift the blame like that. We have to engage in self-examination. We have to look at our own heart and our own life, and we have to kind of look and see, how am I doing with what God gave me? How am I doing with the situation I'm in with the resources that God gave me? We can't look to other people and say, well, how did they help me with this? It's something that we have to examine on our own. Um, Imagine if I go back to being stuck in the snow. Imagine if I just stayed in my car and said, well, eventually somebody's going to come help me get out of this parking lot. I mean, my senior pastor worked crazy way too many hours, and I don't know how long I would have been waiting for him to walk out of the church um, to help me get out. I, so, so that would have been really foolish, right? For me just to sit there and go, well, somebody's gonna come help me eventually. No, I had to take some personal responsibility, and I had to go out, and I had to look for help. Personal responsibility means that sometimes we open ourselves up to that correction that we need. We, we let people know about the problem that we're having. So when we're taking personal responsibility, we're also not comparing ourselves to others. This is not, well, did I do as well as this person? Or did this person do as well as me? It's not a comparison game. It is very much focused on what did I do with what God's given me? How did I live? And when I was stuck, did I reach out for help? Did I go to CR on Monday night? Was I honest with my life group? Did I communicate with a Christian friend? That is what taking personal responsibility will sometimes look like. So, Christian community, spirit-led people, we should be humbly willing to share each other's burdens, and we should also be taking personal responsibility for our own load. So, as we wrap up, okay, I don't really expect us to go out and start having super deep conversations about really deep sin issues right now. I just don't think that that's going to happen unless you already have really great relationships in your life. You have to have relationships in order for this passage to come true in your life. In order to experience this kind of restoration, in order to be a part of this type of restorative process, you have to have good relationships. So this week, here are some options. Tomorrow night, I'm sorry, Monday at 6.30, okay, show up at CR, Thank you, guys. Okay. Show up at CR and be honest about what hurts, habits, and hangups you're dealing with. Just start to share it, and you'll find a group of people that are in the same boat as you, ready to walk alongside of you. On Tuesday night at 6.30, show up here and be a part of Summer Life. Okay? Hey, we actually got applause for Summer Life. All right. Hey, so... We have two more nights of summer life left, and this is a chance to start to build relationships where you can be honest about what's going on in your life. And then you'll have an opportunity to sign up for the fall and continue to develop relationships and just talk about things and begin to have friends that will be able to do this for you. Now, I know that whenever we start talking about CR or life groups, there's people going, You want me to sit around in a circle and talk about my life? No, thank you. Okay? Um, You're probably more of a doer. You don't want to sit around in a circle and talk about your life. Okay. Join a serve team. Okay? Join the children's ministry team. Join the youth ministry team. Join the first impressions team or the hospitality team or the coffee crew. 
join the security team, join the chair team. I mean, choose a team that is busy serving at church and meet with them every week or every other week and serve. Because what you're going to find is also a group of people that love Jesus and care about you because they're glad to have you on the team. They're glad to be serving with you. So if you don't want to sit around in a circle and talk about your emotions, then join a serve team and start doing things around church and develop relationships that will help you. And finally, maybe you just need to open up to a Christian friend this week. You need to set up that appointment. You need to go and get coffee and just start talking. Just start to build the relationships and see what God will do with those relationships in your life. So spirit-led people are gonna bear one another's burdens and they're gonna take personal responsibility for their own life. They're gonna humbly walk with and encourage and pray for and help their fellow Christians that are stuck and weighed down with a burden of sin or with a difficult life. I hope you take the challenge that you see in Galatians chapter six today. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, uh, it is with gratitude that we come to you and we say thank you for restoring us. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to be our savior and giving us a better relationship with you than we had before, giving us a bigger purpose than we had before, making us a new creation and leading us in life change because of all that Jesus did. God, we're thankful that you restored us and now we wanna just ask you to open our eyes for those around us that need help in that restoration process. Those who are burdened and weighed down with sin or burdened and weighed down with difficulties in their life. Lord, we want to be the people that come alongside and encourage and show them the way back to honoring you and relating to you. So Lord, we ask that you would help us to do that. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Spirit-led people help those who are stuck. They help with humility, and they take responsibility for their actions. Are you being led by the Spirit in your life? If you're new to Calvary, we'd like to get to know you. Would you consider visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash connect and filling out one of our connect cards? If so, I'll contact you sometime in the coming week to get to know you and pray with you. Well, that's all for today. Please come back and join us again next week. Bye-bye.